so it's not realism. It's not like a photo, it's just like a spiced up version of a photo. Wait, I can actually show you that. Wait. Ooh, that'd be fun. Let's see. You do the chromatic aberration in Photoshop, you do that in Fusion? In Photoshop. I wanted to ask about that. I don't want to get too nerdy about chromatic aberration, but it did seem like yours is a little bit more accurate. I have like one way of doing chromatic aberration here. Yeah. I use the lens correction. I go to custom and I have a positive and the exact same number as a negative value. It's just that, nothing else. Wow, sick, dude. And I use that for over 10 years now. <laughs> just gonna, I'm just gonna start writing this down yeah. right now. Hello, welcome to Pixel Peeping. In this episode, I get to sit down and chat with Cornelius Damrick, a legend in the CG art industry. You may have seen his work if you've messed around in Octane over the last several years. He's made a bunch of popular artworks and these epic CG illustrations that take a ton of time and effort. Really generous of him to sit down with me and talk at length about his projects and his history. And he gave us a behind the scenes look at a lot of his different files and projects. It was great to be able to sit down and chat and nerd out with him and ask him a bunch of questions. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Cornelius Damrick. Cornelius, what's up, man? Uh, not much. Playing games all day. <laughs> right yeah, now. good. Like a few weeks ago, I finished my latest, biggest thing project. And usually what I do is I just take some time off between projects and put my mind somewhere else, completely off digital art. Just watch movies, listen to music, play games. Then I come back and the inspiration gets flowing through that and then... That sounds I, great. I mean, that sounds some, healthy yeah, too. Yeah, sometimes I have that thing that I, like I finished the big project and then I jumped directly into the next one and then I burn out midway. Yeah, I mean, that definitely sounds like the ideal way to do it. It does feel like this is pre maybe part of an evolution because I've been a fan of yours for a long time and I want to get into some of like the stuff that you do specifically. I think that's unique to you. I think one of the things that felt unique to you is that kind of like grind, like some of the early talks when you talk about some of your big projects like it seemed kind of painful you know in a way yeah sadly that's as part of my my whole thing your brand <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. it doesn't seem that way now or, or do you think it is back in the day like when i was still very young like 18 19 20 uh, there there were like a bunch of artists on cg talk and cg society or 3d total that always won these choice awards. I don't know if you remember that yep. back in the day, you could win that CG choice award. That was just a thing that all the ILM guys won that constantly with their stuff. And was yeah. like, oh, yep. that's the goal, like teenager goals, right? Yeah. There were like a bunch of guys from Blizzard. They had just a certain level of quality that I never understood how they could push their craft so far that they reached that level. It looked so good, like so much better than the stuff I was doing. Then after year after year and trying harder and harder, I found out it's just like takes a shit ton of time to do this stuff. But it's not like people who spend three days on a piece, they can spend up to a few months on one. There's like people from like, I don't know, Marek Denko, for example, he yep. spends years on one piece. Years. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, Marek Denko is a huge uh, inspiration to him. One of the <laughs> Still, OGs. Yeah. yeah. OG, really, for real. Like there's like stuff, this really early stuff he did to this day. I, I look at that. And yeah. It still holds up. It's still oh, absolutely. Quality. And I just learned, okay, he's just taking more time and pushing it. Each each element, each step in the process is just pushed. I always thought there was like cheats. They you they know a software, a secret software or a workflow. I don't know, and that's the re the reason they they go so far. But you can only do so much with software. In the end, it's just it's geometry, good materials, good lighting. That's all it comes down to. There's no weird post effect no shortcut really it's just hard work <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it took uh, like it took years to accept that for me and now it became this whole thing that the scene like i i'm in like that's the the people who use octane render they they come more from a motion graphics yeah thing and they they don't have half a year to work on a single image. So they, the turnaround time for their projects is way shorter. It takes them 
a year to make one piece or half a year to make one piece and it's something special among these people yeah like not, okay. not saying that they are like that it's their work flow is bad or anything it's absolutely just no, no i get you no yeah but it's just like something they don't see that much it feels like like if you ask an environment artist from blur studios or a character artist i don't know they that's not nothing like oh wow do you, you need for that environment you worked a half a year on that it's just like okay yeah daily business for them i think yeah, no. And it's something I did want to kind of ask about. In that community of the Cinema 4D and Octane people, you do seem separate. I wonder even, the kind of work that you do does take a long time, and just the details are crazy, to, like the extent that you can go. And do you think that because Cinema 4D developed into this niche, like this sub-niche of doing commercial work, motion graphics, like speed became one of the things that Cinema 4D and Octane does whereas like if i do something to play around with offline rendering i'll use maya i'll use arnold and that's like super slow like even to do a, a sim in maya is slow to do a render in arnold is slow so in a way it could be that using tools that are made to like quick turnover kind of allows you to go even farther in that amount of time because of the amount of iteration because of the amount of like not immediate feedback but mm -hmm. octane you know, can give you this super speed if you yeah. know how to use it and everything. Octane is like when you only start a project, it's super snappy. It's just like bam, 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 bam. You know, it's just you have that what exactly what you're saying, that that instant feedback and the IPRs are super snappy. Octane isn't just really made for giant scenes. Technically it is made for that. It's just I know I never it. had yeah, you can it breaks it the snappiness goes away when once you hit 15 mil polygons then it's starting to get slower and slower but i never had the experience over the years that there was a single render engine who really felt super responsive still at that level like okay 15 million is probably nothing but like the latest project that my, my last one was 30 million and then it started to be really like you started the IPR and it took just like four minutes or five minutes to just really give you something. Hmm. I don't know when you come from Arnold and Maya, if that's also like a thing there, but that you m use a software in a certain way in order not to break it. Like you careful what to click and how fast you click and hmm. you don't refresh materials and be like really slow and it's like having a goldfish that you just bought and you put him into into new water and you have to bag around him and just like really you want to ease it mm -hmm. a little bit for the <laughs> for the software and i have that thing with once i hit certain limits like back in the day it was okay maya is movies and films and that stuff arnold as well and then you have for architectural stuff you have v-ray and games are 3ds max and motion graphics for commercials or advertisement is cinema 4d it was always like that yeah but there was never like i never heard from like i know the guys at maxon they never build it that way they were not like okay we building the software specifically for the for the commercial guys for for advertising and motion graphics there's stuff they did that was just used for that more often. I don't know, maybe that was the licensing system was good for that or it was easy to use and the graphic designers could learn it easier than compared to Maya. I don't know what the reason was for that, but uh, they were always super happy that I didn't do really that commercial, that it was more like cinematic in a way, even though it yeah. was just still images. I actually no idea why I never tried Maya. It's I mean, it works. Just, in, in the beginning, like when I started, like my first day with Cinema 4D, I was in eighth grade and a guy gave me a CD with a wow. cracked version. That was it. So if he would have given me like Maya, yeah. it probably would be yeah. Maya you yeah. said today. Yeah. So. A cracked version on a CD. Yeah, that's, pretty, yes. that's pretty strong. Yeah, 8.6 it was. It was uh, wow. Uh, I used Cinema 4D for a second, but yeah. I don't remember why I moved on. I remember when Body Paint or something came yeah. out or was along with it and that was the first time i saw painting in 3d and i thought that was yeah. incredible yeah i never like used body paint like the at some point there was mari i think yep. and then there was substance painter yeah i wanted to ask you about that because i use substance painter you know it's big in games yeah. obviously 
yeah. uh, and it's cool to see you use it for cinematic stuff. Sometimes people, I mean, I think it's just nature that we put things in boxes, as you say, like it's not that Maxon was trying to make cinema 4d, but these kind of things develop. A lot of times when people ask me, they're like, if I'm doing something really cinematic or high quality, I should use Mari. Right. And it's like, well, you don't have to. Uh, so it's cool to see when people yeah. use it for things other than games. Yeah. So that's also like this entry barrier thing at some point when I, became freelancer i had to pay for the stuff so i couldn't mm -hmm. just justify cracking and pirating the, the things because it wasn't even like a hobby user or student where i could this stuff like cheaply and then there was like okay substance mari <laughs> also there's like more resources the feels like for substance so yeah it was an easy choice yeah it yeah. is better i think more user friendly i think mari yeah, it feels like lot. photoshop just like with 3d in a way mm -hmm. So let me ask you, and this is a tough question, but how would you describe your art work or your style? Personally, um, that's really tough, but people describe it as hyper-realistic. So it's not realism. It's not like a photo. It's just like a spiced up version of a photo. It's just the, all the reflections are all super art directed and neat and looks like a video game cinematic in a way something like in that like visually i always wanted to be super dark but it's not <laughs> i'm afraid Maybe dark like a dark tone like edgy kind of thing yeah like blade runner do you got some blade runner in there i get, yeah i mean i think hyper realism is a is is a cool word i like that word too yeah. your your stuff feels photorealistic in a cinematic way and i don't mean yeah. like a video game cinematic you know like shot on yeah. film type of stuff it's not like you see oh it's is it a photo or is it like i have certain yes. pieces that where you could ask the question oh is it a photo is it 3d yeah. but like with the big pieces like i made like for the syringes i don't know if i know. You saw that I yeah, yeah oh yeah i saw that yeah people that that's just that's a still life kind of deal. yeah that, exactly that's exactly how i thought so you're doing things that feel like a still life but that's what is so cool is that you know you're doing these things that are in different kind of separate niches or something i know you've been mm -hmm. doing it for a long time so i think it's just you're at a point where you do what you want but it's it bridges all these categories we're also just making like a shot and colors characters and i know you jump around into marvelous designer and stuff mm -hmm. so it's just a lot of different things i think if you zoom into any of these things and i think that's kind of how i see the syringes is just like a very you know macro shot of something typically i would say your stuff would seem like 90 something percent photorealistic unless like the parking lot like the famous splash screen yeah. for octane but then there's like a surrealism element that makes it like what's going on here and then you have some on the like really strong sci-fi end with the colors you know the a 6088 ad you yeah. know that was one that feels very unique and very like not of this world yeah, it's it's a weird like for me, as the person who worked on that, I have still to figure that out. So that there's like this final stretch of visual fidelity that that is missing for me, like as the artist who works on that, and I don't understand what it is. It, I just don't get it. That's just like that tiny. I can push and I can push, but it's. it's just unreachable i talked to friends and they said it's maybe it's octane it's just octane has a certain look to it because of the like path tracers look all the same technically but then you have these presets like it's the way you work with it defines in a way the look you get from that and that's different from arnold to octane to corona or whatever yeah. and that final piece of fidelity that i'm still missing i see that and that's why i i will never say okay that's photorealistic it looks like a photo because i always see that it's not a photo like wow. or, or any expert obviously can see that like people who work in cg see that it's not real yeah. but for me it feels way more comic-y and way more stylized or hyper real than than actual like some like people who would push for photorealism the fact that i i work on that and i see it weeks day after day and can't just like because my eye it's burned into my eyes yeah. and then there's like that final step that i can't reach <laughs> it's just, yeah I don't, I don't know it drives me crazy i'm so that's pretty much what i'm working on right now why 
like that's i want to figure that out <laughs> yeah that's that's cool to know it, yeah that seems like one of the motivations or driving forces as you trying to get to a what would you say just a place of realism or or would you put no, the photorealism like, kind of tag on it i don't i can't even put a finger on it yeah that's like this is just i ca always call it visual fidelity there's still like a certain degree of quality that this person like this name is color sponge I don't know if you oh, know yeah. him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, Color yeah. Sponge does some crazy stuff. No, yeah, the Corona he... with cars, and I saw him and Ash Thorpe were, were brain dumping, so I think they're they're on another level right now. I, yeah, they, I mean, there's some magic sauce to it. Yeah, there's that some I magic. I mean, he's famous for his tires. For me, in my world, he's famous for his tires. Yeah. He yeah, gets yeah, 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 yeah. sick tires. I would be curious, like, I'm looking at your syringes work, mm -hmm. you know, in your opinion, like, what is it like? Ah, you're like, yeah, it's pretty good, but it's just. Oh, no. So that's the thing. Okay. It, now, now it comes. Now it comes the fucked up part. That's only with the big pieces. Yeah. Okay. It's not with the syringes, and also like I have these void renderings. You know, when there's like just a single floating object and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. They they are perfect. Like no, okay, not perfect. But nice. They, uh, I like it, but you're but you're happy with them. I am like they have that level of fidelity. But the, yeah. um, like from the latest you touch, you buy, I have like a bunch yeah. of renders. Okay. Yeah. Like with the cash register and everything and the sausages and the sausage cooker construction, they are like on that level. They have that fidelity I'm looking for. Okay, cool. I can only achieve that on a macro, make macro yeah, level. Yeah, I, I totally get you. Okay, cool. Now, I don't know how this will, how this will come off, but this, as a viewer and a fan, this is kind of how I see it. Like. I think, yeah, on the macro level, you got these things and it's super high, like fidelity. I want to have a little chat about dust, you know, in a sec. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> so you're literally like, you know, on the macro level. Yeah. But then on the, I mean, we're kind of, I'm kind of interchanging words now. So I'd say just on the micro scale, you've got this super high attention to detail and realism. When I see an entire shot or piece, it feels that it has a style and I respond really well to that. You could probably find comparisons like in movie directors, film directors, you know, like who's that guy that does, he does like quirky, like hotel Budapest and all that. You know what I'm saying? Wes Anderson. Yeah, Wes Anderson. So like yeah. there, there's some film directors like Wes Anderson where like, obviously the people are real and the, everything is real, but he yeah. has a visual style that doesn't seem like someone just went out and snapped a photo. So yeah. I think that's like a strength. I don't know if it is, but it sounds like some of it is even coming from you in a way that's maybe natural to you. The mm -hmm. way you're, you're using strong and bold colors and the way that you have, you know, the, the writing and the pipe. Like you just have something about it that you make a curated image. It's just uh, a taste. Yeah, it's but it's not, it's not, I would say in the comparisons to like the color sponges or some other people, they, they're trying to make it look like a photo that's not trying to be, you know, an illustration. So yeah, I like the fact that yours have this this quality about it. Yeah, I'm generally happy with my work. And I think it's a good thing that I still find like aspects of it where I think hey, I can improve here and there. So it would be boring if I think, hey, I'm perfect. I don't oh, have yeah, to no, work would, anymore. <laughs> nobody yeah, does. Yeah, and it will never stop. I'm pretty sure of that. I had that when I was in, in it for one year and I still have that. And it's like 20 years ago where I started almost. So yeah, I think even if I'm, when, I, when I'm 40, it will still be things where I think I can improve. And Yeah, I hope we all feel that way. Or we just want to keep getting better on this journey and it's always it's yeah. always different yes uh, well let me chat to you a little bit about these like i would i just would call it cinematic details i don't know what else to call it but the plus yeah, no, no. series uh, yeah. i love uh, seeing these because we get different kind of techniques but like you know from the depth of field to the bubbles in the water and the translucency you know the the grime on mm -hmm. the lighting and stuff there's like a film grain. I don't know if that grain is from the renderer, but there seems no, to be. It's, yeah, you know. I add that afterwards. Okay, cool. I just am curious, I guess, about two things. I like to get into like the details and like how you do like the water and is all that stuff. But another thing that I feel is different, at least than me, and I think some other CG um, people, is that when I look at these, the on like all of your works, and when I watch your time lapses. It mm -hmm. feels like you have a clear vision, more so at least than me, 
when you start. The end product, at least, feels like you have a vision. You, it means something to you. You know what you're after. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not so much. Yeah. Sometimes people just kind of play around, like, you know, the people that do dailies for practice and stuff. And they're just kind of what happens, happens. But this feels mm -hmm. very intentional. This is based on the piece I did 15 years ago. Oh, So wow. I already did that one. I can show you the old version. It's yeah, please. Actually, can you see oh, that? Hey. Yeah. That's the old one. Cool. I don't think I've ever seen this one. Yeah, it's from DeviantArt. It's like super low res and shitty. Uh -huh. yeah, wow, and so, it really is the water one too. Yeah, cool. It's like the like a super low res old version with old software. And I made that 2007 or something. And I thought, hey, I like the idea behind that so much. Like yeah. back then it was just like I watched a movie. It's called Stay. Just Stay. Stay. And there's like this one shot of the hallway, like a completely green hallway. And back there, then, and just, I don't know, I thought, hey, let's build that hallway. And then I put water in it. You know? That's the early CG days. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm going to make a keyboard or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, I don't know. And then I thought, hey, the idea is actually like the visual is so powerful still and i really like the the colors and how i did that with the light and everything that i w just wanted to do an updated version to that yeah and did you move the camera at all like does it line up perfect it looks very mm, similar yeah it's a little bit different i think yeah yeah but it's i opened the original scene file i still have that i don't know just started from there yeah but technically it's all different all the the elements it just is mm -hmm. different now i have depth of field now i didn't have that back then the water refraction and the light the atmospheric light in the water mm -hmm. and the bubbles like is that for me i would have to do some tricks to try and do that like is that is that just full-on simulated or are you doing like how are you doing that so it's i can show you that you have a plane a displaced plane mm -hmm. it's just that with the water material so you get refraction the thing with planes like because it's just a plane and something like a plane in reality doesn't exist either. everything has thickness right yeah so you don't have like everything that is like from the point of view covered by the plane will refract but everything outside of it won't have refraction so you have like an in infinite refraction pretty much i have a water material and everything below that is just a volume that's just a box yeah. that has fog in it so it's not a complete water body because that wouldn't work with the camera somewhere mm -hmm. it's also like cut off right so the cameras yeah. are just floating outside of it yeah it the camera is like, like in the water it's got that look that's cool yeah yeah but it actually isn't like actually it's just one meter away from from the edge and nice. it's just like an optical illusion the way that, that the bubbles and dust i mean is that maybe that's added after because like the imperfections are crazy um no i think the bubbles are in there it's octane scatter also we have dust in the air you don't see that in the original rendering or just barely there's All dust that... in the air yeah you have the <laughs> camera effects it's yeah called. camera oh dang you have you do physical yeah. mo whoa camera dust and it's just the whole air is full of dust but you can't really see it i just rendered that dude like, yeah. crazy <laughs> okay okay wait so is the is the dust on the camera or just in the air like are you also in, doing no no some... in the air it's okay. just like on the camera itself there's that's just like a body that's filled with dust yeah. particles just floating in front of the camera. Then there's bubbles on the surface too I can see right of the water that you're uh, scattering yeah. on the plane I guess yeah that's just and it's not bubbles it's uh, debris I love <laughs> that you use geometry oh, uh, yes, and I guess everything. octane scatter is dope I've seen other people use it it does seem super yeah. like it's, it seems super useful you know you mentioned I mean, that, like having geo because the way octane works right my basic understanding is that like it has to store everything on the card because mm -hmm. it's all GPU rendered, it's yeah. not using your it's not using your CPU at all. So it has to like kind of store everything on the memory of the card. So that's why these big yeah. beefy cards work. So that means when you're making decisions on like I'm adding dust, you have to load all the geo on the card for something that yeah. is making this tiny difference. The thing with Octane Scatter, so you have like scatter systems from C4D like MoGraph, um, they work differently. 
they go through C4D and the viewport and everything and Octane Scatter bypasses that. It can write these clones that you created directly into the VRAM of the card without going through like CPU RAM bottlenecks inside of C4D. It's just like bypassing that. It's, it has just 1% of the functionality of the real MoGraph system. It's very, very basic what you can do with Octane Scatter. But it's almost free? No, Octane Scatter is included in Octane. But no, what I mean anything. is um, because you're instancing, you know, are you just paying for one little thing? Yeah, you, just one asset and everything else is just instanced. And you can get away with, I don't know, I had like objects with 5 million particles scattered on it. And you can almost get away with in, in like this. It's still so snappy. Wow. If you okay. do that with MoGraph and C4D, you would do 100K and it would C4D is unusable. I think Redshift has something like that as well, where you use like matrix object and I don't know how they do that, but it's... Yeah, Octane Scatter is really easy to use and fast, very fast. Yeah, really useful for all this kind of stuff. It's people doing yeah. it for environments, you know, rocks and all yeah, this stuff. Trees using it for, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great to be able to use it for small things. That's so mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so just out of curiosity, you know, you mentioned cheating. I always tell people that there's no such thing. So whatever. I mean, there's, whatever... obviously there's certain cheats, but it's not usually well, not. I think AI is a cheat probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, or I mean, there's like shortcuts you can take, obviously. If you know the software, there's probably people who know like faster ways of doing something, optimizing their workflows. But it's usually not like, yeah, you just press one button and it cuts away four weeks of work or something. It's mm -hmm. not as easy as that. <laughs> well, what kind of things are you doing to the finished render? So I render out as an open EXR in ACES these days. So it's not lin just linear yeah. anymore. So but so you're actually baking the ACES in? Yeah, you. I render in, in, in the ACES color space. So I have like 32-bit EXR with ACES mm -hmm. inside. Okay. Like it's baked into the image. My current workflow is that I use light passes. So I have for each light, I have oh. a pass. And so I can combine them and I can just fine tune the lights oh. if I want. So I can make one light stronger, wow. uh, not so strong. And then I can control that all in the, in the compositing software I'm using. Okay. So, so, that, it, so it's all packed into a single EXR, but you have the split. You're actually no, no. doing that. Uh, yeah. I don't use multi-layer EXR. Okay. So I have just. I don't know, 20 EXRs. I have a bunch of passes. I have CryptoMat. I have um, reflection passes. But I don't rebuild the, the image. So I still have the beauty. Usually I have just light passes. I stack them all and fine tune them. Then I, like, for example, um, when I th say, okay, I want that pipe there a little bit more shiny, then I select that with a CryptoMat, put like a reflection pass over that so i have like double d reflection and i just fine tune mm -hmm. it a little bit and say okay Great. a little bit more reflection here then i have sensor glow like exponential glow it's a little bit like photo halation from analog mm -hmm. film then i have film grain on top of that just the one that comes with camera raw in photoshop yep so yeah the workflow is cinema for the octane aces output fusion black magic yes. fusion Okay, that's what you use for compositing? Yeah, then I build like a sRGB EXR with that that I load then in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And then I do camera raw yeah. color grading. I, I finished all my images with camera raw too. I don't, it's, yeah, it's I, I love the workflow because it's like editing fo like photos. Exactly. I really love that color correcting stuff in DaVinci Resolve is very powerful for video work. But I, I feel like I'm too stupid for that still. So I feel very much more comfortable just Photoshop. Like not, not Photoshop, like camera raw in Photoshop. Yeah, it's like Lightroom, but it's yeah. in Photoshop. Yeah, and you can save yeah. some stuff. Yeah, I've tried Lightroom. There is something fun about that to like edit your renders like a photo, right? It's kind of yeah. in the same like... It's like you took a digital photo and you're yeah, playing with it. Yeah. You get the same pleasure of someone that took photos. Yeah, it feels exactly. fun. Then, yeah, I have camera grain, then a chromatic aberration. So, yeah, always a little bit, a little bit. You do the cr yeah. chromatic aberration in, in Photoshop, you do that in Fusion? Yeah, it's uh, no, in, in Photoshop. There's like that camera lens 
thing, yeah, the lens the thing and filter. Do you add some distortion in there? Wait, I can actually show you that. Wait, oh, that'd be let's, fun. Let's, 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 see. let's edit something. All right. So, yeah, what we have here okay. is we have camera raw filter and lens correction. Lens correction is the, the one I was referring to for the chromatic aberration. So yeah. this is that's called ACES display, that layer, right? So you double click that. And then there's the, like, before I used Fusion. <laughs> just like, so, it's just, like I say, it's just so, I just feel like it's so on brand, dude. Just like things getting so big and out of control because of the yeah. details. So that's how it looks out of Octane. Yeah, still super dope. Yep. Wow. And we, we, we turn it all off. So Ooh. that's how it looks out okay, of Octane. Okay. Cool. So yeah, you there's can see stuff. the bubbles, yeah. but they are not as strong and everything. Yeah. So then I had like like passes and I combined shit. So I made like these mm, rays stronger. Yep. So you see more of the God ray effect, or I don't know how you would call that. Yeah. Then we have more reflection. I don't know if you can see that, but yep. it's just making the bubbles here stronger and the, yeah. the reflections on the water and everything. Looks and it's the just paint, like, makes the paint more wet feeling too. Yeah. Or more, more glossy. And then we have like the lettering here on the door and the reflection of the lettering. It's all Sick. one pass. Oh yeah, there was like a shadow. I added a shadow there in the door frame. And then there's another reflection. No, that's the that's actually glow. Yeah. It's the camera glow. So how do you do that? Uh, that's an octane pass. Fusion has when you have the plugin reactor, there's a plugin called Exponential Glow that works exactly like Octane. And I use that in Fusion. But uh, before I had that, I just used an equivalent. Yeah, and then it's just all 32 bits, so you can't do too much crazy stuff with filters or anything. It's pretty much just having these layers coming from Octane 32 bit. And here's a, a lot for converting ACES into sRGB. So we're baking that in, and that's inside of that smart object. And this one is actually 16 bit, so it's not. 32 bit anymore. I but see. 16 bit. So you're referencing your yeah. first so, passes uh, as a smart object into Photoshop. Yeah. Then you're going to yeah. do a camera raw on top of that. Yeah. And the, the camera raw looks like that. I mean, it's pretty basic. It's uh, nothing, nothing crazy. I know there's probably photographers cringing about what Oh, I'm who cares? Doing. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. We've been, we've been bastardizing Photoshop for forever. That's well, whatever. Yeah. I mean, we have a grain. Yep. Vignetting. There's actually no vignetting here, but it's probably on the, on the optics. Yeah. Yeah. What about vignetting. effects? And do you use any of that? Any weird stuff? Ooh, I no. see you do a little curve action. Yeah. Curves like here. Curve. No, nothing here. Details. Just a little bit more sharpening. Color grading. Here's a little bit Ooh. of grading work. Mm -hmm. So. Hey, nice. I make it more warm. Mm -hmm. The yellow tinge to the highlights and the clamping yeah. of the highlights is always a way i feel like it makes it look more like a like an re type of camera type of film look you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah and the grain i don't know i just love that that grain a friend of mine who's like a color grader and he says like i, I use grain like roger deacons mm -hmm. because it's just it's still so clean and it's not as dirty as as it can be and not as rough. Yeah. I use grain like people who actually don't want grain in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why yeah. that's why I love Deacons too. Everybody loves Deacons. It makes things look yeah. so and, real. And then yes. I have like one way of doing chromatic aberration and it feels like Okay, it's the I wanted to way. ask about that. I don't want to get too nerdy about chromatic aberration, but it, it did seem like yours is a little bit more accurate where like because a chromatic aberration would fringe more it would separate more on the edges. You know, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be this. Yeah, here. Yeah, that seems like what we're seeing. So, like the center of the lens, the here, colors are still sharp. Yeah, yeah, that's the, what I hate when you do it manually. So you have all these channels separated and scaled them differently. It's not yeah. as accurate. No. And I use the lens correction, and usually that feature is made for removing chromatic aberration. But what I do, I go to custom, and I have a positive, like the red cyan fringe is always like some a positive value, and the exact same number as a negative value is blue yellow. And I use that; it's just that, nothing else. Wow, sick! Dude. And I use that for. Over ten years now. <laughs> just gonna, I'm just gonna start writing this yeah. down right now. No, but it's it, it's perfect. That's the best 
chromatic like it's I so have... simple and it yeah and it, and it looks more accurate it makes sense i i get what you're saying because it, it's actually photoshop's kind of simulating the spherical yeah. bend of a lens so so you do, the center yeah. is still the the colors are still lined up and i i have yet to find a single app or plugin or whatever like that does it like that yeah like and that's that sick. works as perfect for that like here you can see it really cool. yeah that's awesome I think I did a chromatic aberration workflow in a nuke following some wizards because I'm really, I'm stupid. I mean, you can like, you can probably do that in fusion even better if you have like, but it's so complicated and like, look, look what we get. We're already in Photoshop. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we talked about that. The writing on the wall. I heard a a while ago that at least for some of your work, because this is kind of part of your style, which is interesting. I don't know if there's any story about that. A lot of people don't like their own handwriting. Yeah. I think your messy writing is very pleasing. I like the look of it. And so when you're writing all over your work, you know, are you spending time like making it perfect or is it really your writing? How do you feel about it? Because some people cringe at their own writing. That That's the art directed writing, right? Okay, so cool. That's obviously, I make sure it looks, it looks wonky enough to be real, but not super wonky. So it mm-hmm. looks CG. Uh-huh. Still pleasing. Like, you know, it has to be sellable as something that could be actually be done with a marker or something. Like yeah. If you have these self makeshift markers filled with paint and yep. something like that. Then there's the writing in the phone booth. Uh, yep. I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah. actually my actual writing. That's how I would like, because I actually wrote that with a Wacom pen thing. Cool. And was just like really writing it. Yeah. Like, I had like a rule because I couldn't like cross stuff out. Or like I couldn't like use the eraser. So you had to so cross out. I, yeah. I had to cross out or if I made mistakes, I would just have to deal with them. Also, I couldn't like move stuff around so it would fit. Sometimes I would run out of space and it would just be, a, well, deal with it. Because Perfect. like you can't do that in the phone booth if you don't calculate the space good enough. Right? Yeah. Or, then you have a problem. I try to use that. Is the writing in 52 hertz where this started yeah wait no wait let me see yeah i think yeah it started there what was the impetus or the kernel of the idea that you know it looks great did you just start and then you're like this let's just keep going this looks cool i mean it it, you know looks like different people it looks like you know it it imbues story and world building in a way you know it's very Mm -hmm. human i started with some of them and then i thought okay let's just continue i live in germany when you are in a, in a tram or something or in a train you have like these like sometimes people use coins to scratch messages into the onto the windows or addings and write that tags everywhere and i was, was like okay that's cool but i want one step further sometimes you find like the instagram names of people on the wall or something but that like over the top and people writing a whole story and it's almost like a thing like in a catholic church where you go to to confession um, yeah confession like you you say everything you can say it's just just a collection of song texts and stories of friends because i got a job offer from cd project red, red like in 2015 or something for an interview they were like yeah can we invite you to an interview please work on cyberpunk or something i know i had like really like big struggles with anxiety disorder back then i was almost didn't reply to the email I was just like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to ruin the game. Please don't hire me. I didn't want to move and everything. And yeah, it was just... Yeah, they were... They were li- here, please stop. Try to hire me. I won't relocate unless for Blur or Blizzard. Funny enough, <laughs> yeah. I got actually like like years later, a friend of mine said, hey, there's a job up opening on the cinematics team for Blizzard. But then I just met my wife and like my then girlfriend but Mm -hmm. she's now my wife and we couldn't relocate she was still in in university and stuff but that was like my thing okay i will only go to the us if i can work in the cinematic team at blizzard entertainment Uh, yeah usually the stuff i put in like a box was just the personal stuff i don't know it was also at a time where i thought that was would be cool to just do that because there that was the first ever project i did with octane Oh, okay. 
from some people that don't use Octane probably don't know, but yeah, this became the splash screen for Octane for yeah. years. Every time someone opened Octane, they'd see it. It was just the the perfect mix of let's figure stuff out because I'm like I like figuring things out, like technical things. And Octane is and was just so much fun compared to the stuff I did before. Like I had the first time I had an IPR and I could just in real time art direct stuff and it was just amazing. I had so much fun and that playfulness is part why why this worked. That's out a good word for it, yeah. Also like I playing around with these shaders and these scratches and the sticker, that's another thing that i see that yeah that you crush is the stickers that are peeled off and the and the glue mm-hmm. and the paper residue yeah i like that's, that that's perfect and it's only well, because i found one map on textures.com <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's... did you give a talk or show a demo of making that once i don't know if it was from you but i thought it saw... hurts i think i think i did showing the point. yeah showing the yeah. making that exact kind of thing and it has a um, height and everything right it's crazy oh like i on on stream like in the last piece i did also a lot of stickers but the workflow for that is different in this piece the stickers are just a uv map so i just map them and they repeat like you you can see that's just a tiling thing so it's maybe it's just box mapping actually mm-hmm. on it. it's very sloppy <laughs> i mean it's supposed to be I gotta say though, it does. It seems like a hole in one for you to use Octane for the first time, and then mm-hmm. the image becomes the splash screen for Octane. So how that went down was I got a DM in the mm-hmm. Oct- official Octane forum, and they asked, "Hey, can we use that as a splash screen?" And I said, "Yes." And that's it. Like, years later, like there were, like I'm actually pretty cool with the team, with the whole all the old toy guys and everything and i i got a lifetime license now and everything but oh, like sick. the initial yeah. thing was just hey can we use it and we're like yeah sure yeah it's usually how it happens in 3d yeah it's just it's people messaging you and saying hey can we use that and like, yeah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's yeah. yeah i have a friend rafael rao He's also from Germany. Like every week he's doing a one tutorial about Octane, usually like some oh, wow. notes or something. And I was talking to him like, hey, can you make the standard material? And he was like, yeah, but I don't know. Isn't that boring? <laughs> <laughs> but I know like because it's the Arnold thing. I also don't know if it's like like usable at the state it's now. But okay. I, I know from that they want to. I saw it in the roadmap and yeah. it got me super excited because that's yeah. that's how you do skin. Yeah, in Arnold. And yeah. I love Arnold. It's very physically accurate, it's, you know, out of the it's box. It's very, very powerful. Arnold is probably well, the most powerful path tracer there is. Yeah, it's like completely unbiased. It's just slow as yeah. F, you know. But yeah, I mean, it's made for movies and such. So it's made for people who... for At they, render farms. Can, yeah. yeah, and can throw money at a problem that solves the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it yeah. seems it seems like, I mean, they're adding GPU. It seems like GPU is the future. So hopefully more and more things. Um, back to the writing, though. I did hear, at least for some of your artwork, you use your iPad to start doing the writing textures. Do you do yeah. that just on one or two of them, or is that how you would do your writing textures now? Yeah. Like for the wall? I th- I don't know, actually, if that... I think that's also on, on the iPad, yeah. This one was uh, Photoshop with a Wacom Intuos Pro, I think, that broke, actually, like... <laughs> few weeks ago it was eight years old (laughs) pretty (laughs) good yeah yeah so usually i just have a the uv guides so i have like a wireframe of the actual object that i unwrapped and then i use that as a guide to know where i have to write sometimes i make like in in body paint 3d actually say front back so i know what island of the uv is the the correct one and then i just write on it but these days i would just put that on the iPad and procreate and then use that. It's more natural to write and you can do it somewhere else and take your time. Yeah. Also, I like the iPad is small and it feels very snappy in procreate. Uh, Cintiq is uh, like, I actually had like a really, really big Cintiq for some time, but it was too big to fit on my desk. Really? (laughs) Yeah. It's a giant one. You can see it obscuring me right now. Yeah, yeah, I know some guys who work at Wacom and he gave that to me for, for like, I had it for one and a half years and he was just like, yeah, it's the the, the thing we have on, on like trade shows. Just keep it and play around with it. And when you decide to, 
If you want to keep it, then we can arrange something. I don't know, you get it cheaper or something. But it was too big. It was 32 inches or something. And like the, the heaviest yeah. and the biggest one they had. And, was, mm -hmm. and the, the Intuos also is nice, but it has no display. And the iPad is perfect because it's super small, lightweight, and yeah, Procreate is super snappy. It's really, it's the snappiest uh, like pen display experience I had so far. Like I wanted to say, like you doing characters, you probably picked the the most complicated and the hardest discipline in three D. <laughs> yeah, it feels like. <laughs> yeah, but I, I feel like I bypassed the, because I'm not try. I I gave up on trying to do photo real. You know, when you're young, I think that's what you try and mm -hmm. do. And I think the the advent of photo scanning and seeing like oh ILM and Weta like people don't even like do that by hand anymore why would you no so i kind of went off in a way where i feel more free and fun where i'm like i'm not trying to it's okay yeah. if my stuff looks like 3d it's and okay, yeah. you doing the merrick danko way it's like yeah i mean trying to make th worlds that don't exist look real to me that yeah. seems extremely hard so when it comes to characters i usually use das <laughs> yeah and yeah i do like some octane shader fuckery with marvelous designer and try to hide the face as much as i can or do robots so that's that's all the character stuff i can do like i did one there's this piece i did with the old man in a in a bomb sitting in a bomb and that was so much work <laughs> like that dude like the body hair and everything because he's almost naked and like imagine that that you don't have to hide all the shit and you can just show like even like grooming for body hair and like it's just a rabbit hole itself like hair then there's skin which is a rabbit hole like there's like you can write books on how to make cg skin like the history of cg skin or skin in in computer graphics it's you yeah you can study that for years probably absolutely and then, and then like 3d scanning faces hand painting them and like all the workflows and then reproject there's that website where you can buy these face face scans where, where you mm -hmm. can use the textures um what was the name that's the, the most 3d scan store yeah and they have like this russian app where you can just reproject yeah. 3ds wrap or you, yeah, you have to go to russian <laughs> russian 3d.com or some weird website yeah. yeah yeah and it's just like it's so that's workflows I've never heard of. And it's just like only for characters. That's yeah. just the whole thing just for characters. And then there's probably a whole thing for rigging them. And then there's absolutely like so yeah. It, yeah. Like 20 years in the business or business, yeah. <laughs> but I scratched the surface on characters. like just like the barely when mm -hmm. it comes to that, but it's ex exciting, right? That CG yeah. is like, you can spend, decades in an industry and there's fields you've never seen before like oh yeah I, also as technology and things are getting better there's gonna there's this i mean it's exciting for me being specialized in characters yeah and i do think the fact that it was hard when i was young that's what i did you know like i was like i want to do that thing you know because yeah. that was what i responded most to is the digital characters in the movies i loved like how did that so i just had this like narrow focus but nowadays being able to dabble a little bit in grooming and, and rendering, uh, it's exciting because the tool, I'm being more enabled than I was before so that maybe we can expand a little bit more because doing characters might work for, you know, so hyper-specific, maybe it works for jobs or something, but the art of it, like the stuff you're doing to make illustrations, to make like worlds or make something that has an emotional thing, not just a character standing there. And that's what's exciting to me, so... Yeah, and I like think the future is going to bridge it. Is yeah. also an art in itself. How did you pose your guy, um, the old guy in the bomb? I think it's Das. So I exported okay. the, the bomb. Then I had the chair, but nothing else. And then I just posed him like in Das with like... it's. Oh, cool. I didn't know you could pose in Das. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's not like intuitive or anything. It's just like... And you really, sculpted uh, on him in ZBrush? No, it's a pre-made character. Oh, cool. With the so wrinkles I, and everything. Yeah, yeah. Tight. That's the only old guy they had. <laughs> <laughs> so I did a skin shader. I hand painted tattoos on him. Mm -hmm. I made like all the hairs and everything. So I had like an animation where he was like from a T pose to that sitting pose. And then I did that in Marvelous. So the jacket would move with him inside of the bomb. <laughs> and 
I think he has shorts <laughs> and all that fun stuff. Uh, yeah, it was still, even though it was pre-made. The thing is, like, I was at that point where, like, 52 hertz worked well. We had an astronaut. We couldn't actually see the character at school. Yeah. But, like, I can't be that one-trick pony, so I need a character in that mm -hmm. one. I can't do character. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, learning a character for that project, that's not going to happen. Like, it takes years to go to that level where where you can sell it where believable. it's at yeah where it's at a stage that it's so believable that people won't say hmm that looks off or, mm -hmm. hot, or i don't know yeah so there was no way i gone would, would do that just like that and uh, there was also no pre-post one so and all all the people were recommending das like that's usually the way people go when they can't do characters is they use a character creator like das mm-hmm there's like a bunch of them that are realistic and have like extensions like HD textures. And you have to go through a jungle of weird looking stuff in their weird looking DAS 3D mm -hmm. store because there's like so much junk in there. <laughs> Pages of junk and we find some good stuff. Do you have this file too? Would you mind? Could you? Could the, we see? The bump, yes, yeah. sure. He looks pretty high poly in here too. So you're not using any like displacement maps or anything? I don't think so. I, I would assume at this point in your career, you got kind of a beastie machine and you're still taxing. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you yeah. got multiple GPUs? Yeah, four. Four? Yes. Damn. So you probably. Uh, what, which, which GPUs? 3090s. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you got any special power? Like I power? have two PCs and. Okay. Two PCs and each has two two thirty nineties. Okay. And I used the one I ran over network with them, so okay. I can. Is that an, is that a both. Octane or a Cinema Four D thing? The rendering over the network. Yeah, you can do that <clears> with Octane <throat> almost without any bottleneck. It's really really powerful and really like you don't lose any performance. Really getting back to the fidelity thing, that was also not a problem with this one. That scene. Because oh, yeah? it's the, one of these, it's in the void. That was yeah. the first one I did like that. I always call them void renderings. There's an object in a black space and you have mm -hmm. lights around it. And it's just the perfect composition and everything. It's just, there's no artistic or, or creative problem you have to solve with that because it's so forgiving. And that makes it really like, like the materials and everything in that piece is really on point still i think that's the highest quality piece i ever did to this how long day. did it take you that's a good question i forgot probably a, a couple months probably i did that like over the period of a couple months because i had a day job at that mm -hmm. time and wasn't freelance you even have years. a different pose of him floating with a different jacket oh, and everything look like, hey it works yeah hey yeah there now he is can look at the stuff Ooh. So yeah, what is his sure. what does his face actually look like in there? So we don't have like generators now. There would be a cable, but it's still a generator. That's the that's the nose air yeah you know, mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah, and he's from Das, so you get him like that. And yeah, he has the shorts and the jacket. The jacket. Yeah, <laughs> he is... did marvelous on the shorts. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, and the the jackets is also marvelous. Looks great. Yeah. Yeah, I use it like. A high poly version also yeah. <laughs> because fuck it <laughs> I mean, you're, you're probably you're probably more advanced at marvelous than i am now i gave up after a few characters that was too much for yeah, what it was I worth mean, for me you can also do houdini these days uh, you can hand sculpt it you can do blender even c4d is very capable now i'm not sure if you could do that with the c4d but yeah there's also like it's i think it's intersecting somewhere here uh, so it's not perfect, but it's good enough. For <laughs> I like that that bugs you. Yeah, so you even have a different pose, you know, in your presentation. You have him floating. Like, that seems like that would take more time yeah. and you'd have to do another Marvelous Sim and all that. Uh, yeah, that was that secondary piece, right? That was hard to do. The one where I started. So I have, like, the project structure that I have a main piece and then I have secondaries, right? Mm -hmm. So I have, like additional shots back in the day it was just crops high from the high res yeah. so i would render the or different angles in. yeah or different angles but that doesn't always work because getting back to the one of the first questions when i start a project what it should look, look like in the end that's because probably because of the fixed camera perspective right yeah that does never change 
that's the, the thing is I block things out in the beginning. So it's a sketch and then I no, don't change the camera angle bec and, and work for the camera. And that's why I can't always change the camera around. So I'm not building a 3d space. Like it's a set where you can walk around. I build it like a theater stage almost. Yeah. So you have the locked perspective of the audience, the viewer or someone in like on, on their screen, right? You have like depth because it's a 3D space, but you can hide there. Like you have an object in the front and you can hide the space behind that object. So there's no assets there, for example, and it just looks crowded or full of objects, but it's actually not that full. So that creates problems when you want to turn the camera because then you can actually see the places where you cheated a little yep. and and one of the things i want to change with the next project i already know what the next project will be is that i built a scene not like a stage but more like a set that you oh. can walk around on so i won't lock the camera from the get-go and be like okay let's just build the thing like it is and then yeah, that's just a, like, maybe that's the problem with the fidelity. So I'm trying different things <laughs> to, to get to the, to the culprit of it. He is like, I had all the stuff, all the elements, all the setup for the dust and the hair and everything. I just had to reapply it really mm -hmm. uh, to him. And yeah, that also is one of the first times I tried my luck with the skin shader. Yep. I don't know how successful I was. Yep. Like the fingers here, I don't know. It's. They are very red. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe a little too much. But the the, like the legs the, and the leg hairs look good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah. Looks like a looks like a fuzzy gun too. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, why is it so fuzzy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, if you to me, I think if you look at it for a sec, it kind of maybe it could be ice crystals in space. You know. Yeah. Let's you say just get the cool is... rim lighting. Let's say yeah, it's ice crystals. What's my intention? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you got some fuzzy bombs too, dude. There's spider webs on the bombs, dude. Yes. Oh my gosh, I just noticed. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, can we talk about dust for a sec? I think it'd be yeah. fun to kind of maybe put a button on that by doing that. Yeah. If we could pull up the syringes and take a look. Yeah, I mean, the fun. images are insane. I would just love to see the setup and then like, what mm -hmm. is the dust? Like, what is it? Dude, it doesn't matter how close you get. It, it even looks like not one shape. Like a painter would make a stroke that kind of evokes something. It looks like little hair fibers or something i don't know it's crazy man. yeah is it texture. a mixture of textures or no it's it's fibers like Whoa. the dust is and there's bubbles too yeah so the dust is something that's called a platonic object uh, which is like a low poly sphere kind okay. of and then we have two hairs so one dust particle and two fibers and those are geo like two like two low poly spheres yep that are different from each other hairs which is like just a spline with the sweep nerves and then yeah, yeah a hair a geo based hair <laughs> and yeah they they iterate between them so it's yeah so, so you did that for that. variety right yeah you have, they're a little bit different from each other yeah and they're scattering like so in, just four in, elements right yeah and you are pieces i have 30 different hairs but damn dude <laughs> yeah it's just but it's not like crazy it's super low poly everything is super low poly yeah then i scatter that on the wow. that's just a sim like i had a low poly yeah. syringe i modeled there's actually a video how i did the whole scene yep i looked at it and then um i'll just super while you're talking about it, i'm just gonna superimpose clips from yeah. that i'm just gonna steal it from your channel yeah that, it's just a sim with a low poly thing and then i replace the the bodies for the sim with the high poly once because I can just replace the actual geo. Then I just copy the high poly geo, make like a proxy model for from that and cut away everything that's in the bottom, just like the top ones. Then I use these because <laughs> the hair and the droplets, you wouldn't see them down at the bottom of the sim, okay. like simulated stuff. Okay. It's just a waste of, of resources. So just the top ones, then I create a volume. So the mesh gets super even everywhere. And then I hide that by I use the data from that object to scatter the, the particles on because Octane Scatter has that one downside. It scatters more in poly dense areas. Ah, so, so you need to make sure like, it's even. Yeah, I have to make sure the, the, the SDS modeled syringe isn't really even. You have areas like on the head that's a little more dense than other areas. 
is it would it be easy in this scene to show the 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 two dust models and the two fibers? Is that somewhere in the scene? Yeah, I can show that to you. Wait, I can... there's your dust that's, particle. That's super low poly, as you can see. And do these get subdivided on render, or is this exactly how it is? No, it's exactly how it is. It's just Great. so tiny that you don't really see that. And it just has a standard material on it, like just some. Yeah, it's it's um. So I change that sometimes depending on the scene. Sometimes it's super like it's reflective. If I want like hair, actual mm -hmm. hair, then you have like a little highlight on it. Yeah. Like I did that with the with the tooth. I don't know if you Ooh. remember that. Right. So here you can see like highlights on the hair. Yeah. That's a different material. But here it's black diffuse material. So we don't have any color and when we have one hundred percent transmission. So everything so it's like uh, translucent. Light, yeah, it's translucent. It's like one way of doing SSS and Octane is you can do specular material with a volume or you can do a black diffuse material like 100% black and set the transmission to one. So it lets everything through. And then we have a random color. So everything is a little bit different from clone to clone. Sick. And the <laughs> opacity. It's just like... 50% opacity so you can actually see through see. that again but it's super basic like that's super you can I wouldn't say base I mean it's cool to see basic models you know yeah. and you're using basic like in the material but you know it has such a such a nice effect so it's always great I always love seeing like when the behind the scenes is like kind of simple things done together to create something that looks really great and complex yeah and here that's the platonic object yeah when you're scattering, can you like vary the size a little bit? Is there randomization yeah. and stuff? Yeah. I mean, we can actually, I can show that to you. So let's say, let's say medium, right? We can actually, I can walk you through the whole process. Hell yeah, dude. So, okay. Let's scale them up. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's say that's our objects. We want to scatter. Then we create something like an octane scatter object. It's just like that. And then we make these objects, like the the objects we want to scatter, make them the children of the octane scatter. And in the octane scatter, we just set the distribution to surface and then link the actual surface. And in our case, that's that. So each of these lines is now a clone, right? Sick. Mm -hmm. We can actually, looks like that. Oh, now. yep. And now we can use the effectors that were used in cinema for the or are made for the cloner object for MoGraph, we can oh. use them with the octane scatter. Oh, cool. So we have okay. random, for example. So Great. we have octane scatter, effectors, and then we say random. So now it's a random position. It's 50 on X axis, Y axis, and Z axis, mm -hmm. 50 centimeters. We don't want that. No, none of that. So we want scale and we use uniform scale and say minus 0 0.8, for example. So now we have, cool. you can see we have the size difference. Yeah. And then we go to the random effector again and say we want rotation. And then we just say 360, 360, 360. And then we have to do that again. And now we have that. Here we go. And then we obviously, we can use a different effector that's called a plane effector, right? So plane, we put that in here as well. And plane, all it does is to move it on one edge. So it's not randomizing per instance. It's just scaling or moving everything at once. Okay. And I want scale and we can say uniform scale minus zero point. 0.9 for example it's minus one would be zero so yeah. invisible and we want to make it really tiny right so now it's really tiny as you can see awesome and then we crank the shit up to yeah. one million <laughs> to polygons million. but we like for that there's like this display thing then i set that to none mm -hmm. and then we don't have any display in the viewport at all yeah so it's all gonna it be on the on the card when it renders yeah, exactly. Sick. And that's how I do that. And then you fine tune it. It's pretty much just fine tuning. So you look at it and like, okay, that looks shit. We need more. And then, <laughs> yeah. and, and then you say, okay, it's too much of the same thing. We need to change the material. And then you, 
that's just like <laughs> all the greatness comes from art directing it yeah because, i just like i yeah. just, that's a good i feel like there's a good tagline to your brand is it, it looks shit we need more <laughs> yes i mean yeah that's always the thing i i say hey it looks cool but it would look cooler when i do this and that yeah, and yeah. i do this and that and then it takes half a year <laughs> it's just yeah. like that's great though. i don't know yeah that's great though. Sometimes I feel like the getting into CG when you're young and early and at that time where we were, where doing things was so much more difficult than it is now that it's almost like it feels, it feel rich nowadays, you know, that you're like, we could just, let's crank it, do more. It's like, why not do more? It's exciting that in a way that I suspect maybe, um, people getting into it now, you know, a little bit more disenchanted with all the cool things, you know, like dust. I'm super excited about <laughs> yeah. Dust is geometry. Yes. I think that's awesome. I think that was also Marek Denko. He had this. His level of detail from a geometry point of view was mind blowing. Even then, that was like 15 years ago. He made 3D Studio Max look good. It's this one, yeah, souvenir. Yeah. And here Crazy. he has dust, 3D dust somewhere. I don't know. I somewhere he has dust, and then. I think is it in the clay somewhere you can see it. Yeah, here on the, yeah, on the yeah. Uh, wow. plastic and everything. We were like, "Damn, son, <laughs> he modeled <laughs> the dust." So, and then I mean, what from what year is that? That's from does there, he even see it? 2013. 2013. Wow, ten That's years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. Do you, have you ever then, met this guy? I just like that he's a mysterious. In, in my head, he's a mysterious. Like personally, stranger. Not. I, I've seen a uh, interview with him on oh, yeah. the D two conference, <laughs> but I I have never met him. Like back in the day, like this one, mm -hmm. I studied that. Me piece too. Re I did the I did the damage on the ground with the water in there. The like. I, I still. How did you do it? I, yeah. I still to this day I would have problems doing that. Because like the thing in CG that I don't know for me at least it's very difficult. Like, if you have big surfaces, like making big surfaces look natural. Like if you have something like that, you can obviously use displacement mat and use tiling and everything. But how do you make it like that mm -hmm. it looks natural and not procedural? Yep. And there's like, you can obviously not use a big high poly sphere and sculpt it by hand. It's not going to work. It's too high poly too quickly. And I mean, you can technically do that, but you would need, if you bake it down, you would need like a 16K map. And if you use GPUs, like 32 bit 16K isn't not, that's just two gigabytes of VRAM just in one texture, something like that. It's mm -mm, not good. <laughs> like big surfaces, like, even if you have walls with plaster or anything, it's still not that easy. No, for me at least. Yeah, I don't actually know how he did that back then. I think. Look I mean, at the wireframe. You see the ground. It looked like it was modeled, unless you sh unless you can render the. Oh yeah, you're right. So yeah, it's just it's, smoother. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's just a displacement. displacement map that's not visible. Like here, that in in this case, it's high poly. Yeah. But, and yeah. this one was more than 10 years ago. Yeah, it's very old. And it still holds up to this day. Oh, no, yeah, it's it. sick. I mean, yeah, the, timeless. I think that's yeah. what that's why was, our minds were blown then. It still holds up. Crazy. Well, a question I wanted to ask, maybe to wrap up what we're chatting about here is, you know, something you kind of alluded to before is, well, when I look at your work, there are themes that are mm -hmm. consistent. There's like a style. Um, but then even like these ro the robots kind of a, a reoccurring character. Do you mm -hmm. see these works as connected more than just the old man and the bomb? Is that something yeah. you see separate from these other things? Like, are you creating yeah. kind of, you know, is there like a bigger world or story that you're yeah, so working on? When I started with 52 Hertz, the parking lot thing, I had that name Zomax from that song. It's called Oh Boy from Jackson and his computer band. And it's just a song and his niece is telling a story about a special project called Zomax. And it's just like the whole text, just telling a story about a crazy doctor with his animal birds and stuff. And I took that name and was like, yeah, special project called Zomax. And that made that my identity in a way. Right. And then that sounds super wonky in the <laughs> now, but then there was another song from Amon Tobin, which is a drum and bass electronic musician 
thing and he made that really great like it's not drum and bass in a it's more like he's like a sound designer right and he has a song that's called delpha and i like the the sound of that right like the 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 how the word sounds in my head and delpha is actually a, a dutch company who digitize uh, newspapers <laughs> i think or historic newspaper or books or something so they scan paper but it had not has nothing to do with that it just decided at some point hey delpha is a company or a place or something from now on i make that the acme of of my world like gotcha. if you have the roadrunner thing there's always the fictitious port- company yeah or in portal games it's aperture science yep and so in the beginning it was just a company so i can have something i can put on the the 3d models of the products that don't exist in this world because i i thought because i modeled most of the stuff myself like not all of it but a huge part of them it's self-made and i thought hey let's let's just brand them in a way and put delta everywhere so that's the company over time that it evolved so it's more like a city like a city state or something or a town or a country or something or its own world right and it's not like there's like a big master plan that i have like a book written down where i take parts of and make images out of these stories are created while i work on them yeah like when i build the corner store for example the latest one yeah right i have i thought okay i want that corner store and that's just just the corner store that's the main motivation is building a corner store in 3d and the technology aspect behind it so how can i pull that off how can i fit all that shit into the vram and so on that's the main motivation but over time because these projects take me so long and i have to invent all the stuff for it it organically just happens to create its own world so we have the cashier which is from the 608880 80 image it's just the robot that's on the on the sidewalk with the gun in his hand that's the mm. cashier and over time you because you have to think about these elements that you put into the image that they make sense that you kind of develop a story or some like narrative on the fly but it's just not a process you do like okay i'm sitting down and i'm like thinking about a story and that's going to be the next star wars or something it's just like it needs to be there in order to to sell the image to the people who see it i know it's just like a part of the design process kind of over time with all these images started to become like its own feasible world in a way so you have all these elements they play together then i had like a bunch of nft drops these elements from these nft drop states tell a story and obviously now i know oh that's becoming a thing kind of like there's a theme to it and they build upon each other and then i can take that knowingly that this is now the reality the artistic reality i live in and push that even further and over time like this makeshift groundwork to to of a company or to tell a story becomes its own world it's not like i'm sitting here and writing down these words because i don't know it feels like it's becoming more natural when i do it through the work when it grows with the work i don't know it's that makes sense you're developing it Right? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a super weird workflow in a way. When I sat down and made that robot, I was just okay. Was just like okay, there's this girl, and I had like the reference picture was like a child in a Pikachu suit, like a costume, <laughs> and I was like okay, let's create like a gang, and it's only girls, and they all have these animal clothings that look like crocodile, and they have like a hood, and in the hood are these teeth, and I couldn't pull that off back then but like in the plus thing in the plus image series there's yeah. just like that there's like the the character soul with the orange suit she has that she has that hood with the with the teeth pointing inwards so that's the element i well, had like in my pinterest folder for ages and i thought hey that's inspiring i just take that and now that we have that like she needs like some some companion that was just an random idea and then i had that 
robot with a leash <laughs> and an AK-47 in his hand. And now that's one of the main characters of a story. And it just grew over time. It was never, like, supposed to be that thing. It's just like like I'm having a child and I don't have a book to read to the child. And I'm just sitting on the bed next to it and telling made-up stories. I make things up. Like saying, yeah, there's a world with a little <laughs> animal. And it's like people do that. Yeah. And I don't know, probably some of the most famous stories in, in the history of <laughs> of child children's stories are probably based on stuff like that. Maybe. I don't know. Now it's like super, like there's elements from like, like we have, do you know Borges, the, the author? Borges, I don't think so. He's like <laughs> futuristic author from argentina i think oh god i hope i don't mess that up now but he wrote like these stories about the aleph and uh, el zahir which is like the aleph is a point in in a wall in the cellar of a friend where you can see the whole universe at the same time and each it's just like super crazy stuff and el zahir is like a random object that makes you addicted and i i took these elements like like he didn't invent that but he that's like a motive from that, like an ancient motive, El Zahir is the last alphabet, like the last letter in the in the Hebrew alphabet, and Aleph is the first one in the Arabic alphabet. I don't know. It, okay. Either way, they he took that that concept and wrote like these these fantastic stories around that, and I took the same concept, knowing that he wrote it, and made like the phone receiver I use in all the pieces because that's oh. also a motive I just reused over time because like sometimes I don't know what to put in the pieces and then I just come uh, phone receiver why not and now that's the whole thing right so I took the phone receiver and made that El Zahir the, the object that everyone gets addicted to and if you see 52 hertz you see okay the the astronaut is grabbing after the the phone receiver because he wants to reach it. He wants to reach for the connectivity or like he wants to connect to people. It's like actually something I wanted, like I felt deeply back then, but it, I didn't think of like, oh, that's the, that's the motive for an ancient myth or something. It's just like phone receivers and like that, that motive of connecting to people. That's the first impression I had with that, the first idea. But then I developed that further and like in 6088 AD, you can actually see the astronaut holding the phone receiver in, it, in, in its hand. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, he got it, right? Yeah. And the next piece, which is like, you touch, you buy, you, you get to the corner store and they sell phone receivers in boxes that say El Zahir <laughs> for two ninety nine, <laughs> right? So that's like, I take this motive, the phone receiver first, it's about connection. Now it's about making you addicted or whatever right? right and it will go further and further and further and it, i don't know it's just like an organic thing for me to <laughs> weave these stories into my pieces over time that's, well, that that's was a long great, answer yeah. sorry for that no that's great man that's great that's great to hear because yeah I, I like to hear the little details but in a way i almost don't want to know too much because it'd be difficult for you to see on the other side but you get the sense and there you see that in, in some other work. I would bring up Lord of the Rings a lot since I, mm -hmm. I'm a nerd about that. But even without going deep and you can do that forever to find answers to things, there is a sense that, and you get that when you look at your work, that things have meaning from the creator and that there's, that it's deeply personal and that there's something going on. And that's, it's, you know, it's just the difference between something that's human and, yeah. and random. And it feels like it's from one it has one voice. So even even if I'm not connecting the exact dots or I don't understand the references, you definitely get that that sense. And I think because it's it's influencing your decision making. So I think that's just really cool to hear. I listened to like a lot of Korn when I was a teenager, like the band, the US yeah. band Korn. And I didn't understand the, the lyrics, but still like whatever he sung was deeply emotional to me and I understood it on my level because like I didn't know the exact meaning of the song but like I thought I would know something <laughs> that it would be like may maybe in the same ballpark or something yeah. it's just like making up my own my stuff because the atmosphere and the tone and everything yeah. aligned well with my emotions back then as a edgy teenager and yeah 
I feel I think it's the same thing with visual art. If you look at it and think, "Hey, awesome," or I don't know, it just touches me on an emotional level. It looks yeah. like my mom there. Or, I don't know. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I that's, that's the that's, art of it. I think that's yeah. the, that's the art of it. That's what it ha your work has. It feels like. Oh, thank you. Art. That's very yeah, nice to hear. No, yeah, like, and I, and well, I, that's I feel that such more a huge so than, compliment. <clears throat> well, I, you deserve it, dude. You deserve it. Thank I mean, you, thank it's you, thank you, thank the you. 3D medium, as you know, and and I, it's cool to also know how long you've been doing it, right? Because CG is so much technical stuff and everything. So to to be able mm -hmm. to utilize all that stuff to actually make art, I think that's that's a special thing. Yeah. Like these whole 3D art and CG scene it wasn't even that big. It was just bunch of nerds doing yeah. stuff on a pc and like w when we started we didn't think hey we're gonna make that our job and we're gonna be rich at some point. <laughs> yeah um, no, it was just did it, it for, for the, the sake the of art of and yeah, yeah and for curio curiosity i think that's very important if you talk to people like i i know young people who say hey i, I want to start with 3d to become an nft artist or, i don't know and make a bunch of money and i always tell them that's that's not what what it's about just like ask a musician they always want to be rock stars but they also enjoy playing the instruments that should also be a factor <laughs> like yeah <laughs> so, yeah and please 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 do it because you enjoy it not because you want to be wealthy because there's probably better ways to be get get wealthy so, so much better yeah yeah <clears throat> 3d is not the way <laughs> you, you you mentioned the nft thing and it's one of the things yeah. that I mean, you probably heard before, but in, in the NFT, like kind of art boom thing, you were mm -hmm. my, you're like my favorite example of the best version. Like, so obviously Beeple got famous for for his big sales, but yeah. both of you guys, the thing I, I really re appreciated most and I thought represented the, the best possible version of this is you guys both were making art for the art of it for a long time. Like some of the examples we're looking here. You did years ago and like you you it was not always an enjoyable experience and you're pouring yourself into it i mean it was done for the right reasons from an art point of view you know from a and then later when the nft thing came around and w you were able to mint and sell these artworks to people that really like care about that and value that mm -hmm. that's so cool it's something that didn't exist in the digital world but in other um physical art things did yeah. so I feel like you're you've got your comeuppance in a way, and if I understand right now, NFTs can like fund you and your lifestyle in a way where now you're right. focused on just making art. So like you're essentially being funded by the collectors of your work to make more work. Yes. So that's always what I try to like. I I know there that's like a difficult topic for some people. NFTs they think it's a pyramid scheme, and people selling NFTs are scamming other people, and that's true that this happens yeah. because there's money in it people use it to to betray other people and scam them out of their money or do something that's called rock pulling like yeah. they they make false promises or anything but there's also like a whole scene of people who are doing art digital art for for most of their lives now like for 10 plus years or 20 years even or 30 years and these people they are not scammers <laughs> yeah. so i can assure everyone who thinks that that i am not a scammer and no i don't think anybody it's... would think that dude so yeah I, I really i've always thought of you as the the kind of best example of um what good nfts could do for digital artists yeah, I hope the party isn't over yet. <laughs> I hope so. Just, yeah, it's it's a wild. It was a wild, wild fever dream the last two, three years now, and it's just it's crazy that this even is possible. It feels very surreal still, and I'm I, every second I have in the space, I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> every day, I'm like. Thank God I can do that, <laughs> that I can, <laughs> that I don't have to work on car commercials anymore and can just focus on my art. And it's a very privileged place to be in. I know that it's not the norm and it's just, it was very much dependent on luck. It was everything at the right time. And yeah, I'm super thankful for that. Well, that's good. Also, uh, also, I'm very thankful for being here right now. Thank you. Uh, no, yeah, for sure. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Honored to talk to you, man. Honored to talk yes. to you. 
And uh, thank you for showing me and us, you know, behind the scenes and the little details yes. and stuff. Love seeing that. Good I'm going to link down below to your YouTube channel. Obviously, yes. everyone should check out Cornelius's work. Uh, you have a really cool website, too. Maybe I'll put that down there. But mm -hmm. yeah, you've been a little more active on YouTube. There's great things on there. So another thing I wanted to say thank you for is you've shared info and resources over yep. the last, you know, several years. You can find talks that yeah. you've done to break down. But yeah, I saw a talk that you did at a convention breaking down 6088 and answering yeah. questions about yeah. that. Yeah. And then you have time lapses on your mm -hmm. YouTube channel. And yeah. then now I mean, you're doing it's, streams. It's not the biggest channel and it's not like I'm putting out a video every every week, but all the VODs from my recent stream endeavors are on there if you want to check that out. Right now I'm taking a tiny break to play video games and put my, my head somewhere else before I can focus on art again. I do that as as I said in the beginning, every every once in a while I just shift my focus completely. I'm super happy that your situation is able to fund you to continue to make art yeah. and do it in a healthy way. And yeah, you know, I just think it's great that you, you keep sharing info. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll put the links down below. Go check it out if you want to see more and then yeah, check out his streams and stuff. If you want to learn some more wizardry, making CG illustrations and stuff. Thank you. Cool, man. Well, thank you for your time, dude. Thank you. All right, man. Nice. Peace out. Peace out.